Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I, for one, am excited uh, uh, for t to hear today's talk. Um, as you all know, uh, the issue of the sensitive parts of the fuel cycle, enrichment and reprocessing, and the spread of those has been a major problem for the nonproliferation regime for a long time, and reprocessing in particular, uh, which set in its traditional form separates out pure weapons usable plutonium, has been one of the biggest challenges for IEA safeguards, at least that part of IEA safeguards focused on declared facilities. Um, and for years, there have been advocates who have been arguing, well, we'll go to pyroprocessing, which won't separate pure plutonium, and that will solve all the problems, uh, and I think that's probably incorrect. And uh, But on the other hand, there have been other people saying, no, it'll just make everything worse and it doesn't solve anything uh, because you won't be able to account for it as accurately as you can uh, pure plutonium because of all the radiation coming from the material. And, that's and the notion that it doesn't solve anything may also not be quite correct. So we have probably the best person I can think of to, have, to uh, talk to us about how we should think about this complicated problem. And it, it's a very live issue at the moment because the United States and South Korea are negotiating to renew their nuclear cooperation agreement and the South wants prior consent for any reprocessing enrichment it cares to do, and in particular pyroprocessing. So, Ali, without further ado. Yeah. Thank you, actually. Uh, Matt already describe where we are today and it's nice to see your smiling faces this early in the morning and listening <laughs> this sort of thing. My idea about the pyroprocessing is just to tell what it is and highlight some of the proliferation concerns but not really to go to the next te te detail technical aspects of that but gives you an idea what it is and what it might not be because this is going to be discussed in next two three months heavily here in the US. Uh, Miss Park will visit here I think next month and this is a new president of South Korea and one of the things which she will definitely raise is the issue of a one, two, three agreement with six buyers sometime next year and whether there will be a clause for reprocessing as it used to be or whether they want to modify it. And, you know, actually I have visited these pyroprocessing places when I was in IA and I have followed this more than 15 years, the steps when they started to mushroom there and was a little bit puzzled but now we know where we are today and I'm not going to go to every tiny small detail so I collected you here you know things which you might want to read first is this uh, paper uh, radioactive waste management in Korea which tells I think in very good technical details you know what is their problem in terms of spent fuel and what to do with that then the next paper, which has just been published, is the current status of pyroprocessing development at CARE. This is more technical and scientific, and I'm sure David will love as a chemist to read this one. This goes straight to his heart when he is. <laughs> And then, not anymore, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then is the development of safeguards approach. Uh, this is a very early stage uh, paper, but uh, nothing much has changed since then. And then there is a U.S. assessment about the risks associated with uh, advanced safeguards approaches for reprocessing. And this is mainly to do what we call advanced fuel cycles, which includes uh, also fast re reactors. But pyroprocessing is a chapter there, and Phil Durst and Rick Wallis and Mike Ehinger, they are you know, the ones who have been crafting the safeguards approaches in the IAEA and for the IAEA. So it's a good to read and then they give also the alternatives which might be how you can improve the safeguards in this place. And uh, then as uh, uh, Matt uh, mentioned, you know, the views are divided here. Some people think it's a great idea, particularly in Korea for the re pyroprocessing, but some U.S. scholars are vehemently against it. And I suggest to read the frank assessment of Frank von Hippel on this, because he is certainly against his my friend, but I think his arguments are pretty good in terms of the concerns. But uh, I think that some of them, frankly, I think he goes a little bit too far in uh, thinking. So, I think it's important to make clear that pyroprocessing is reprocessing. 
because in the beginning of this debate, uh, the Koreans particularly wanted to sell this, that this is not really a reprocessing in terms of the reprocess, but it is because it wipes away most of the fission products when uh, fuel is recycled. So then you have a material in your hands which is easier to handle. But as I point out later, it's not that easy because there are a few aspects which st uh, still stay there. So you cannot use it directly for weapon purposes. You need to do quite a few steps there. And how it differs from a, a traditional Purex, this is the one which is used commercially in Kapla Haak, in Sellafield, in China, in Russia, and in Rokkaso, Japan. There, when the fuel comes to reprocessing plant, it's dissolved. And f from there on, the process is all the time liquid. And it has benefits because it's easy to measure, easy to safeguard, and we have a system in place. And then at the very end, you end up again with a solid material, which is plutonium oxide or mixed oxide. But here, it really doesn't come to liquid at all. So you take the spent fuel, I will explain you in more detail. And from there on, it's pretty much all the time in, in a solid or semi-solid form. We see actually then from the verification point of view a very different ball game because it's much more difficult to take a sample and measure them to make sure that the sample is representative. And there are some other hurdles which I saw in brief. And why people are concerned? Sure, because you know once you separate uh, plutonium or have almost pure plutonium, if you want to sprint or break out for nuclear weapons, you shorten the time radically. And if you have a very pure plutonium, so according to the IAEA standards, uh, conversion from pure plutonium compounds to plutonium metal takes only one to three weeks if you have a process readily available. And I think that this is something we, we need to look also in pyroprocessing. But then after that, you know, you still don't have a nuclear weapon. And actually it might take even longer time to turn those to actual components of nuclear weapon and assemble it. Not much longer, but certainly more than one or two weeks. And then you need to have a design and you need to have a nuclear weapon design where to put this material. And let's go now back to the uh, rock arguments. I think some of the arguments are pretty valid. They have a problem with spent fuel. Uh, this is a number which I found accurate is by end of 2008. They had 10,000 tons of spent fuel. Uh, they have been operating about 20 nuclear reactors and it's almost 20 years, or more than 20 years, the oldest one. <coughs> Every year in 2008, 700 tons spent fuel was generated. Today it's almost 800. If you look, you know, the additional capacity which came, came since then. And I think at the important number is the next one. So but at the end of December 2009, 11, they have used 70% of their storage capacity at uh, reactor sites for the spent fuel. You cannot use 100% to start with because you always need to have a space for accidents or some unforeseen reasons. So you need to be able to move the fuel around or take it away to some other place if there is a, some kind of disaster. And uh, how you can solve it? Okay, you can do like they did in Fukushima, make the racks denser, so put more fuel to the spent fuel pond. But we saw what happened in Fukushima, particularly in Unit 4. So I think that South Korea has to think something else, and this is a problem. And then this is a pretty provocative number. I took it from the papers of theirs on those, they say that by the end of this century it will be 110,000 tons if they don't do anything. Well, I think it is an optimistic number in terms of development of nuclear energy, but that's their number. And they say that their problem is that they don't find space for an underground repository, an exclusion zone which is around it. If you want to dispose the spent fuel as it is like in Finland or Sweden. And it will take uh, 80 ki square kilometers. Uh, it's a little bit more than Cambridge, but uh, about the size of Manhattan, if you look at the area. Well, you know dry uh, storage? Yeah, yeah uh, no. spent, no, no, this, spent, this, spent fuel this underground. This is for the ultimate disposal. Disposal, yeah. 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 In the meanwhile, there is... Yeah, I get to that, I get to that. Yeah. So, you know, they... they uh, 
say that it's a difficult to find. This is a little bit hard to believe because, look, you know, Manhattan is not that big island. And if you look at Korea, it's a uh, Korea, I look the area of Seoul. It's only a small fraction of Seoul. So there must be some area in North is South Korea where you find <laughs> or North Korea <laughs> because that, there is as, as you probably just saw you know North Koreans are now having a dispute with Taiwan about one west side so there are enough space in North Korea for this one if someone wants to to put it there and but uh, then we come to the what uh, David said is that uh, why not to build additional capacity it's not that easy at the reactor sites. I don't have a picture here, but if you t go to the website of Volsung or, uh, let's say, Cori power plant, you see the housing next to that. So there is no one uh, image from those which I have seen that doesn't have the res residential people there, because these were built in old days and certain standards. So they have to relocate a lot of people if they want to expand the uh, interim storage at uh, reactor sites. And what did they do? They made this policy decision in 2010 that uh, they go ahead with the uh, system which includes pyroprocessing and fast reactors. So they need to build uh, a very, or design and build a very special reactor which will then burn this plutonium which comes from the light water reactors and heavy water reactors. And recycle also fuel from uh, that fast reactor back and take the plutonium and put it through again. And they have set as a goal that uh, they will demonstrate the technical and economic viability of both the uh, breeder reactor or fast reactor and uh, recycling by the end of 2028. 20, and that's why they are now building these installations. And now there is a new president, Ms. Park. She's going to support this, his possessor on this. Actually, she's a very technical oriented, but also pro, non proliferation friendly and safeguard friendly person. So I think that they are going to go ahead with this because actually they don't also have too much of other alternatives. And what it is then as a cycle? So you have a fuel from a light water reactor which goes to this pyro process and they separate their uranium, transuranium and plutonium, feed it to this breeder reactor and then recycle it back. Or they put this uh, to Dupic process and Dupic process was a very special thing which probably they are not going to build but the idea was there actually to take the uh, fuel from a light water reactor go through special uh, process called Dupic and make it fuel for Kandu reactor because as you know, Kandu reactor is basically natural uranium fuel or slightly enriched uranium. And after burning in a light water reactor, you still have uranium-235 left. So this process was just to actually practically crush the old fuel, make it to powder, press the pellets and manufacture uh, Kandu fuel and then uh, recycle that. So this recycling then will go to this pyro process. And here are the the benefits which they, they list here, and we get soon closer to that. They say that there will be much less waste because most of the material, uranium, transuranium, and you recycle here. So that doesn't go to the register. You only get cesium, strontium, and some other long-lived uh, isotopes here, which need uh, long-term storage. But this will cut the storage time to hundreds of years from tens of thousands of years, in theory. And then they say that when you recycle it, you actually increase the utilization of the original uranium and fissile isotopes by factor of 100. I just put the numbers and you know you judge whether they are correct or not. And then they say that there is an in intrinsic proliferation resistance. So this is the basic cycle. And where they are? Sorry.
So, we are now here. So they did preliminary tests. These are the ones which I saw when I was in the IA. I visited the place. They had a lab scale thing there, testing that they can handle powders in a uh, uh, hot cells in inert atmosphere. You need to have some of these processes in argon atmosphere because you heat the fuel up, and you know you don't want any burning, and you have your plutonium metal there. So it's a very tricky process. And you need to capture the volatile uh, nuclei like uh, tritium or xenon and things like that. And now they have built a system which is called Bright. And this should be ready by May. This is actually, this is not still a system where you, you spend fuel with the radioactivity, but this is a kind of in, inactive, in quotation mark, installation where you test the process using uranium so there's less hazard and you get the equipment right so and then when you finish that then you build this one which I explain in more detail which is actually already reprocessing and you will see that's quite quite an amount of nuclear material which is going to go through so this is an engineering scale demonstration plant which will come then in next five to uh, five years operational and then Based on this experience, then they will build the prototype facility by 2022, and then 2028, they hope that everything is in place and then they can go to the full scale. <coughs> and then a little bit more in details. Huh? So here you have the spent fuel. You take it to a step which is called decladding and oxidation. So what you do is it, you take the cladding from the spent fuel, yet you take the meat or the fuel itself out. You chop it to small pieces and oxidation means that you drive the volatile nuclides away from that by heating. And at the end you have a uranium granulate which you then uh, uh, reduct, do a reduction do something which I explained uh, in more detail, the electrochemical separation, and then you have three streams. You have the waste stream, you have plutonium with certain impurities, and you have uranium metal with certain impurities. But it has a lot of implications. This is the where we are. Now you've got plutonium metal, you have uranium metal. First of all, it hits the heart of the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, which says no reprocessing, no uranium enrichment in Korean Peninsula. This was a uh, joint declaration by North Korea and uh, South Korea in December 1992. Well, one of them has not followed very <laughs> truthfully that, as you know. They did the reprocessing and they went to enrich. Yeah? It's a pity that Gary is not here and I could scold him a little bit. Uh, so that's there, but the agreement is still there. So nobody has, uh, you know, uh, said that it's gone. Certainly some uh, opinions are about that, but I think it's important for the six party talk still between, uh, you know, these various parties to have it there that this denuclearization is still in force. Then we already talk about U.S. Rock 123 agreement and the golden standard. Uh, U.S. government wants that the parties, will, uh, the counterparts, will forego enrichment and reprocessing. <coughs> this will proliferate sensitive technologies. I will talk a little bit more. It's uh, different from the Purex process, but I think that there are more things which I worry than perhaps some other people. Then there is one thing which has been entirely out of quest, uh, debate, is the neptunium, americium and curium, because they are fissile materials. And once you start to recycle, actually, you know, you get a lot of this stuff. And if you want to build a nuclear weapon, uh, there is a difference between uranium and plutonium. Uh, uranium weapon is easier, in a way, to manufacture. But then plutonium is much smaller and, you know, there are a lot of benefits. But it's very difficult to handle and design. Actually, neptunium, some people <coughs> say, is an ideal one. Because it has a properties of uranium. There is no spontaneous fission, you know, and 
uh, you don't have these other isotopes which may disturb so it's uh, it comes to the uranium but it's easier to to trigger the only thing is there that normally it's not separated directly from the rest but here I think there's an opportunity for that uh, amount of neptunium which you s need for nuclear weapon there are there are variations for the critical mass but highest numbers are about 60 kilos I think but some people believe that it's actually much lower and since this is a classified stuff I don't think we find any any number in public which we can uh, trust I'll, I'll show you a US government document that has that number. Yeah. <laughs> I know that they, in 2002 they made some experiments in Los Alamos to establish them but maybe that's the one you go okay but which are the alternatives now you know because it's not that the South Korea really needs, there are other options. First of all, they can send the spent fuel for reprocessing to abroad. Send it to Kapla Haak or Sellafield or, you know, Japan, wherever, huh? China, Russia. Uh, you saw that the annual production of spent fuel is 800 tons. It's actually quite a lot if you want to have it in balance, because this means that you, the capacity, I think, of a rock, so in theory, is about 800 tons. So you you can handle it in principle with the size of rock, so. but since the availability of these reprocessing plants are never 100 percent, you probably need two, I guess. This well, is just a, and also their plan is to yeah, yeah, have more. And yeah, more so you need power. at least two of those. So it's not easy for them to to send abroad because I don't think that cap capacity is anywhere. So. If they want to do it, someone has to build those reprocessing plants. Or you go to multinational reprocessing like the U.S. suggested uh, Iran and Pakistan to do in 1970s. There was a plan for that. And more recently this has been uh, revitalized. So, but again, you need then to find a place where it is. Uh, then you can do like uh, Sweden and Finland, direct disposal uh, of spent fuel. And that takes that 80 square kilometers which is not a huge thing or you just wait but if you wait then you need to build the additional st storage capacity but even if you don't decide to wait because before you have this spiral processing there you are somewhere in 2030s 2040s so meanwhile every year 800 tons of material will come so you need to have additional storage capacity at the reactor sites and also learn the lessons from Fukushima. You may not want to pack them that way. And most likely the best one would be a dry storage, but it will take more space. So they have a problem, but they, they can, I think, solve it either having that uh, additional storage capacity in South Korea or abroad. There's, there are also opposite. So these are the choices which they have. Okay, then let's look. I, I mentioned just quickly through. So first step was that, you know, you cut it to the pieces and you have this kind of, it's almost like a powder. Then you move at this point of time, krypton, xenon and iodine, and, and they are trapped. This one they have actually demonstrated in this Dupic process, which I mentioned, because Dupic was, was spent fuel, which you turn to the fuel for Kandu. So this photo is actually from that process. So this has been technically demonstrated that it Don't works. You need to, to cool it first for three years or something like that? Like spent, spent fuel. Spent fuel. I yeah. think you probably don't need to cool that much because you know you don't have, I, I have not looked it but think about this, there's no liquid so there's no effect of radiation to any, it's only the equipment which will be. So maybe there is a short right. cooling time but so on the other hand you have there uh, 12,000, 13,000 tons of spent fuel, so you probably start from the old one. Right, you have a lot of stuff that's been cooling for decades uh, already, so... Right. And this is the how, how it then works, so the electrical. So you put it to this kind of molten salt thing, and you have an anode, this is electrolysis type of thing, you have an anode which is the uh, spent fuel, and then you have two cathodes. One where you collect uranium and one where you collect uh, plutonium, but it comes also with uranium and americium and curium and neptunium with a little 
fission products. So you cannot get it pure, I understood. Don't ask me why I have not studied this in detail, but this is how it works. And that one they have not demonstrated. Huh? And just the nuance, this one. Uh, so you said before that it was solid or semi-solid the whole time, isn't it? Basically, yeah, although not aqueous, isn't it sort of in a liquid form? Yeah, it's a it's kind of liquid. Dissolved it's in it's the molten salt? Molten salt, you know. Right. It, it's, right. it's not very... You can't drink it, huh? Right, you know? right. But, uh, yeah, it, this right. is the only time when it is this. Right. And then, uh, since it is okay. molten salt, the radiation is not a huge problem because it doesn't split the molecules like a kerosene or... Right, so or yeah, that makes it, phosphate. Right. But you have another problem, which i tell you later. But this this step here, remember people about uh, Iran and uh, uh, pyroprocessing a few years ago when there was a big fuss about it. I think that they were testing this part in Iran, in the lab scale. With it's in the IAR reports. With uranium? Or with uranium, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it has another other advantage. It doesn't mean that they are looking for reprocessing. Because this is also an elegant way to recover you know, uranium from liquids. And you get very pure uranium metal here. And if you are, for example, doing some work related to nuclear weapons, it might be part of the recycling of the turnings from... Uh, it's also what we used for purifying the plutonium scrap at Rocky Flats yeah, yeah, to yeah, put yeah, it into new yeah, pits yeah. to get really pure plutonium. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, and then you run the electric uh, through and we go there. And at the very end, you have this lux, which you then turn to uranium uh, fuel. And how you do it, actually here, what you need to do, this is the end product from there. Then you melt it, put it to casting furning, furnace, you have a rod. Then you take the rod, then you machine it to the right uh, size and shape. Then you put cladding, then you have a few rod, and then you bundle them together, you have a fuel assembly. This is the way it is foreseen. And then we go to the reference engineering scale, pyroprocessing facility, and then to safe gas approach. You see the two pro throughput on this, which they are going to build next, is 10,000 tons per year, and it will handle 10,000 kilograms. Yeah, 10,000 10, 10, <laughs> kilograms. Yeah. So it's a quite a lot. <laughs> it's a quite a lot in plutonium, if you think. It's, it's not any more a trivial quantity. And then for the IAEA safe gas approach, it's the same thing, you know. All, auditing, uh, verification of uh, uh, inventory, in follow the inventory changes, do the map evaluation and make sure that the facility is operating as stated and is designed as stated. So this is straightforward. But this is the way it looks like. So there is the starting point which is always called head end where the spent fuel comes in. It's getting, you know, decladded, uh, getting chopped, put in the pieces, and then it goes to the, this is all in normal atmosphere, but actually under pressure, but in, in atmosphere, not this argon. Part, but. And then the process area itself is in argon, where all these steps then take, there are several steps, you can read it from the, from the not from this one, but the, from the slide. That's so a the amazing the number of steps. Do you separate the, the zirconium from the fuel? Uh, it comes as you see. When you chop it, it is. Your cladding is. Uh, yeah. 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 It's declad right at yeah. the head end. Yeah. And this they did in Dupic already, so they know, you know, how to do it. Uh, and then you have these streams. Yeah? I, and I show them the safeguard system, how this is monitored. But the, there are basically three areas. You know, one is the head end, uh, where you follow actually the fuel assembly until this point of time. Then you have the bulk process, which is here, and then you have the storage, and then it goes to the manufacturing. And it's a, it's a in the beginning, as I said, assembly. Then you make take samples. You have NDA. You have monitors, which I explain a little bit later. Uh, the safeguards draws from experiences. You can draw some experiences from a Purex. Um, 
reprocess in plants like the ones in Japan, France or UK. You take some of the experiences from this Dupic and now you are testing these concepts in this Pride facility which they have just about to finish. And let's go back to the, this is the uh, process area and this is the front end. So you get the spent fuel, you turn it to a powder and then you can measure this powder batches. There, there will be a, what is called a unified NDA system which measures the gamma spectrum and follows the cesium to get the burn up and then from the burn up you confirm then that uh, what is the original uranium-235 content and what is the plutonium-235 content, content in this particular batch. And then you can measure also uranium plutonium and americium and curium with the passive neutron counter. But there is also an active neutron counter to me measure the fissile U235. So it's a combination system. So the agency has nev never had this all together in all in one machine, but all components have been tested separately. I get later to challenge, but the important thing is here that you follow also curium mass because it's a very difficult to differentiate between plutonium and curium because of the neutron. You measure neutrons, so you don't know where they come from. So you follow actually also plutonium curium ratio. And it has to be here when it goes in, it has to be same when it comes out. If it is same in, same out, then plutonium has not been separated and taken away. But you have certain choke points in this system in the middle where you do the similar type of measurement, so just to ascertain that everything is okay. So when you have this powder, the spent fuel powder, uh, that's already gone through an homogenization, mm -hmm. right? So could you also take a chemical sample yeah, of the powder? it will be taken. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and, and here what chemical samples will be used. Chemical samples are taken here, they are taken here. Here, no problem, because this kind of chemical samples is a standard, you know, uranium oxide. But here it's a little bit different, because you are sampling this molten salt, where IAEA doesn't have, or nobody has really a kind of standard, precise method. So this needs to be one of those things which need to be developed. Same thing is with the samples from uh, plutonium metal. or met There are a few new types of materials which need to be sampled, and one has to build up performance values, quality assurance, and all those with the things. Is yeah. the curium mass calculated yeah. based on the um, neutron counting? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And this is explained in more detail in one of those, but I just, most of you are not physicists here, so I didn't want to kill yourself. And I don't actually understand it all myself either, to be honest. You know, it's a complicated thing. But here are the challenges. Yeah. First of all, we have only experience on safeguards in the small scale and lab scale. So how you expa extrapolate this to a real performance is, is a different thing. Then some of the inf instrumentation, since you are working with this volatile high temperature things which have these salts and other, it's a very highly corrosive uh, environment and you need to put instrumentation in or detectors in. So you need to make a very special arrangement that you, know, you can replace them, maintain them, and that they have a reasonable life expectancy. And as uh, you ask, you know, or Matt said, you know, verification. There are a few, few areas where we need to uh, develop uh, and set kind of standards, how good they are, what will be the performance, and how we are sure. And they are particularly the salt and metal solutions. Well, there are a lot of uh, traces of plutonium in the salt. So yeah, yeah, they, that's why you need to have a sampling from each of the waste stream. Eh? And uh, you know, when Are you, you take end up with a lot of holdup in the salt. I think it depends how you how how you handle it. But you know, like a salt, you know, one one of the things I don't know how they do, like how you homogenize it, huh? because the sampling is only good if you have a homogeneous material. So the, these are the problems which we had in the Purex reprocessing. Remember, you know, there were uh, more materials staying in hulls after decladding when we thought, you know, and right. then they were holed up in equipment, then there were all of a sudden some sludges which we were not able to characterize. So I think that these guys are going to hit the same thing when they go from the lab scale to this uh, 
this gap. Now, in past analyses I've seen, they were also worried about just the material, the recycled material being so radioactive that the uncertainties in the measurements based on NDA would be yeah. more. Yeah. That, uh, do you think that's uh, uh, likely uh, to be correct? I think that uh, these studies which are now there and this, uh, why they put this uh, engineering facility, it will be tested there as how it goes in the real life. What you can see, what you can't. When you come with the bigger quantities, right. it's always easier, I think, to handle it in a small quantities. So th this is a learning process. And then let's talk what it takes to make plutonium metal out of it. As actually more or less uh, Matt pointed, it's not that difficult. Right? We have the technologies in place. You cannot use this directly for, for the nuclear device because it has contamination of Neptunium. Should be americium, I see M is missing, eh? and curia. But it's not that difficult. You dissolve it. You do, the next chemical step is uh, most likely solvent extraction, and then you have pure plutonium. Then you just need to convert it back to plutonium metal. But I think that what is, uh, from proliferation point of view, sensitive for me here is that <coughs> actually you are doing a lot of plutonium metallurgy here. You are building equipment, you are handling, you are machining. Uh, when I look the safeguard approaches which are there, for example, I didn't see anything, I may have just overlooked it, but recycling of the turnings, you know, uh, which you have in your weapons, had in your weapons program. You know, once you have that in place, actually, th there is a good diversion route. Eh? So I, I don't know whether they have not yet, because all the papers are to do with the pyroprocessing plant itself. So maybe they handle this one with the fuel fabrication and address that problem at that point of time. But generally, there are a lot of uh, technologies which will support your weaponization activities, and you get experience which you can then apply. Probably you cannot use the equipment as it is all the time for that, but nevertheless, you learn a lot. So in summary, technological, economical feasibility has not been proven. So we see, see you know, whether the realities will take them up. Pyroprocessing has not been demonstrated. Fuel manufacturing is going to be tricky. Waste solidification and disposal. These are different types of wastes. And for example, I don't think that anyone has solidified, solidified molten salt in such a form that it can stay hundreds of years in the repository. These are all work <coughs> to be done. And one of these technical articles, I think it's a First, the second one there actually describes a little bit of work, what is going on, but what needs to be done. And I still think that the, one of the most important things is to fast breed. I think that countries have spent billions and tens of billions of dollars and have not come with the fast breeder technology or sodium breeder technology. So this is, South Koreans have their own designs. Uh, but uh, this is going to be also difficult because I don't think that this cycle is good for anything if this is not there. Because this is the one which burns the plutonium. Yes, yes. If you don't have this, then you end up with a huge pile of plutonium metal. You are dressed up but nowhere to go. <laughs> have, they, have they done any sort of pilot fast breeder? Like, do they have no, no, no. They, it's all, all on paper. All no. on paper. They have done fuel. Uh, uh, they have designed the fuel. They have tested fuel rods. Uh, they, uh, that time they have done, but you know, you need the problem is probably not the fuel. I think the problem is the cooling. Uh, that's where the guys have had problems. Whether it was France, <coughs> China, U.S., Japan, so I think it's a, it's a lot of, and all this should be in place that this system works. It's a less proliferation sensitive perhaps than Burex, but there are still concerns I think. And then what? I think we should also look is Neptunium, Americium and Curium because when you start the recycling, this is a new problem over there. And these are not covered by the NPT safeguards agreement as well. What forget this is a material which is not subject to safeguards, so one has to have certain provisions for that. And then it requires uh, development of safeguards, new safeguards equipment methods. But I think it's a safeguardable uh, at the mm -hmm. end, but a different way, a lot of monitors uh, containment uh, for this process area and it has wider proliferation uh, uh, implications.
in the Korean Peninsula, but also in a bigger picture, in terms of you know, one, two, three agreements and things like that. So now you should think what it means. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much.